Richmond Street, being blind was a quiet street, except at the hour when the Christian Brothers' school set the boys free. An uninhabited house of two stories stood at the blind end, detached from its neighbours in a square ground. The other houses of the street, conscious of decent lives within them, gazed at one another with brown, imperturbable faces. The former tenant of our house, a priest, had died in the back drawing room. Air, musty from having been long enclosed, hung in all the rooms, and the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old, useless papers. Among these, I found a few paper-covered books, the pages of which were curled and damp. The Abbot by Walter Scott, the devout communicant, and the memoirs of Vidoc. I liked the last best because its leaves were yellow. The wild garden behind the house contained a central apple tree and a few straggling bushes, under one of which I found the late tenant's rusty bicycle pump. He had been a very charitable priest. In his will, he had left all his money to institutions and the furniture of his house to his sister. When the short days of winter came, dusk fell before we had well eaten our dinners. When we met in the street, the houses had grown somber. The space of sky above us was the color of ever-changing violet, and towards it, the lamps of the street lifted their feeble lanterns. The cold air stung us, and we played till our bodies glowed. Our shouts echoed in the silent street. The career of our play brought us through the dark, muddy lanes behind the houses, where we ran the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages, to the back doors of the dark, dripping gardens where odours arose from the ash pits to the dark, odorous stables where a coachman smoothed and combed the horse or shook music from the buckled harness. When we returned to the street, light from the kitchen windows had filled the areas. If my uncle was seen turning the corner, we hid in the shadow until we had seen him safely housed. Or if Mangan's sister came out on the doorstep to call her brother into his tea, we watched her from our shadow peer up and down the street. We waited to see whether she would remain or go in, and if she remained, we left our shadow and walked up to Mangan's steps resignedly. She was waiting for us, her figure defined by the light from the half-open door. Her brother always teased her before he obeyed, and I stood by the railings, looking at her. Her dress swung as she moved her body, and the soft rope of her hair tossed from side to side. Every morning I lay on the floor in the front parlour, watching her door. The blind was pulled down to within an inch of the sash so that I could not be seen. When she came out on the doorstep, my heart leapt. I ran to the hall, seized my books and followed her. I kept her brown figure always in my eye. And when we came to the point at which our ways diverged, I quickened my pace and passed her. This happened morning after morning. I had never spoken to her except for a few casual words, and yet her name was like a summons to all my foolish blood. Her image accompanied me even in places the most hostile to romance. 
On Saturday evenings, when my aunt went marketing, I had to go to carry some of the parcels. We walked through the flaring streets, jostled by drunken men and bargaining women, amid the curses of laborers, the shrill litanies of shop boys who stood on guard by the barrels of pig's cheeks, the nasal chanting of street singers who sang a come all ye about O'Donovan Rossa, or a ballad about the troubles in our native land. These noises converged in a single sensation of life for me. I imagined that I bore my chalice safely through a throng of foes. Her name sprang to my lips at moments in strange prayers and praises which I myself did not understand. My eyes were often full of tears. I could not tell why. And at times, a flood from my heart seemed to pour itself out into my bosom. I thought little of the future. I did not know whether I would ever speak to her or not, or, if I spoke to her, how I could tell her of my confused adoration. But my body was like a harp, and her words and gestures were like fingers running upon the wire. We're in the middle of James Joyce's short story, Araby, from his collection, Dubliners. I've chosen this story, not only because it's one of my own favorites, but also because it illustrates very nicely some of the major differences between 19th century fiction and modern fiction. Even though this story was written as far back in 1904, it has many of the characteristics of modern fiction. In the 19th century, the sense of what was significant in human affairs to a novelist was communicated by making his char the characters engage in things that were of public importance. What I mean is that anything significant that happened to a character in a novel or a story was immediately projected in terms of rise or fall in social status, gain or loss of money, change in marital situation, or something that one might call public visible to the whole outside world. This public sense of what was significant in human affairs becomes much less available in the 20th century. More and more writers have come to feel that what is really significant in human experience may be something very slight, some shift in mood, some change in attitude, some momentary feeling, which cannot be adequately represented by a major movement of fortune or destiny may in fact be reflected in no external circumstance at all. And so they develop a much more delicate kind of style in which they try to make objects and incidents in their stories symbols, that is to say, make them stand for a whole area of inward meaning in terms of human experience. And this is what Joyce does with great skill, I think, in this story. The symbolic use of imagery, I think, comes out right from the beginning. This boy is living in a shabby genteel street, in a blind alley. Everything is musty. The sense of real vitality and life and meaning having disappeared, this sense is communicated in all sorts of ways. The books of romance, a novel of Walter Scott, is found curled, stained, and old in a disused room with a broken window. The rusty bicycle pump, the back drawing room in which the chief had died. All this helps to build up the atmosphere of someone trapped in an atmosphere of drabness in which all true excitement and meaning has long escaped. And the sense of wanting to abandon this environment escape from it into a world of romance and beauty and meaning is first suggested by the projection of the image of the girl standing there, bathed in light, while the boys look up from the darkness of the railing below. This is a story based on the age-old scene of the church, the oldest of all literary scenes. King Arthur's knights quested for the Holy Grail, Jason quested for the Golden Fleet. 
the boy in this story is questing for his image of beauty and romance associated with the girl and with the bazaar called Araby that we shall learn about in just a moment, the glamour of the East. And you remember that line, I imagine that I bore my chalice safely through a throng of foes. Here is the glory amid the gladness, the holy grail, as it were. One evening, I went into the back drawing room in which the priest had died. It was a dark, rainy evening, and there was no sound in the house. Through one of the broken panes, I heard the rain impinge upon the earth, the fine, incessant needles of water playing in the sodden bed. Some distant lamp or lighted window gleamed below me. I was thankful that I could see so little. All my senses seemed to desire to fail themselves, and feeling that I was about to slip from them, I pressed the palms of my hands together until they trembled, murmuring, Oh, love, oh, love, many times. At last, she spoke to me. When she addressed the first words to me, I was so confused that I did not know what to answer. She asked me, was I going to Araby? I forgot whether I answered yes or no. It would be a splendid bazaar. She said she would love to go. And why can't you? I asked. While she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet round and round her wrist. She could not go, she said, because there would be a retreat that week in her convent. Her brother and two other boys were fighting for their caps, and I was alone at the railings. She held one of the spikes, bowing her head towards me. The light from the lamp opposite our door caught the white curve of her neck, lit up her hair that rested there, and falling, lit up the hand upon the railing. It fell over one side of her dress and caught the white border of a petticoat, just visible as she stood at ease. It's well for you, she said. If I go, I said, I will bring you something. What innumerable follies laid waste my waking and sleeping thoughts after that evening. I wished to annihilate the tedious intervening days. By night in my bedroom and by day in the classroom, her image came between me and the page I strove to read. The syllables of the word Araby were called to me through the silence in which my soul luxuriated and cast an eastern enchantment over me. I asked for leave to go to the bazaar on Saturday night. My aunt was surprised and hoped it was not some Freemason affair. I answered few questions in class. I watched my master's face pass from amiability to sternness. He hoped I was not beginning to idle. I could not call my wandering thoughts together. I had hardly any patience with the serious work of life, which, now that it stood between me and my desire, seemed to me child's play. Ugly, monotonous child's play. On Saturday morning, I reminded my uncle that I wished to go to the bazaar in the evening. He was fussing at the hall stand, looking for the hat brush, and answered me curtly. Yes, boy, I know. As he was in the hall, I could not go to the front parlour and lie at the window. I felt the house in bad humour and walked slowly towards the school. The air was pitilessly raw, and already my heart misgave me. When I came home to dinner, my uncle had not yet been home. Still, it was early. 
I sat staring at the clock for some time, and when its ticking began to irritate me, I left the room. I mounted the staircase and gained the upper part of the house. The high, cold, empty, gloomy rooms liberated me, and I went from room to room singing. From the front window, I saw my companions playing below in the street. Their cries reached me weakened and indistinct, and leaning my forehead against the cool glass, I looked over at the dark house where she lived. I may have stood there for an hour, seeing nothing but the brown-clad figure cast by my imagination, touched discreetly by the lamplight at the curved neck, at the hand upon the railings, and at the border below the dress. When I came downstairs again, I found Mrs. Mercer sitting at the fire. She was an old, garrulous woman, a pawnbroker's widow who collected used stamps for some pious purpose. I had to endure the gossip of the tea table. The meal was prolonged beyond an hour, and still my uncle did not come. Mrs. Mercer stood up to go. She was sorry she couldn't wait any longer, but it was after eight o'clock, and she did not like to be out late as the night air was bad for her. When she had gone, I began to walk up and down the room, clenching my fists. My aunt said, I'm afraid you may put off your bazaar for this night of our Lord. We no, we no longer have oriental bazaars for charity today, but it's perfectly clear what Araby meant in the imagination of the boy. The story is in fact set in 1894. Joyce was remembering something, we think, that happened to himself. He's looking back 10 years, writing in 1904. And the actual program that you saw on the screen is the real program. It's a photographic reproduction of the actual program. It symbolized Araby, both to the organizers of the bazaar and even more so to the, in the eyes of the boy, it symbolized this world of beauty and wonder and escape that I talked about a moment ago. Everything, in fact, that was not represented by the blind alley of North Richmond Street. And he linked it in his mind with the girl whose image standing on the light on the steps in front of her house sets the tone for the symbolic function that she plays in the boy's imagination throughout this story. But notice, though, this story is about a very heavily charged emotional situation. The tone of the telling is strict deadpan. The sentences are precise and clean and very carefully modulated. There's no tremolo, uh, no lo loss of control at any point. And the details are beautifully ordered with great precision. So beautifully ordered in deal that it becomes possible uh, with a little imagination to turn the narrative into visual detail as we've done here and are doing in our projection of this story for you. Joyce makes it easy for us to do this by his own technique. Well, in this carefully controlled deadpan style, which has just a flicker of irony occasionally, incidentally, uh, like the, the account of the priest right at the beginning who'd been very charitable and left all his money to institutions and his furniture to his sister. In this deadpan style, we move on to the second phase of the story, when he is at last about to get to this world of beauty and romance and light, light, lights and wonder, the world of Araby. But everything combines to frustrate him. His uncle, who has to give him the money to go, <coughs> comes home late, and when he arrives, he's half drunk. It's so late now, he thinks he'll barely get there in time. But even at the last moment, he's delayed by his uncle taking up the word Araby and translating it through in his vulgar sentimentality to mean a silly sentimental poem, which he then proceeds to relate. The boy gets on the train, 
but it's so late, there's a special train for the bazaar, it's so late nobody else is there. The desolation of a situation is made clear. And as the train goes on to the late night, almost deserted bazaar, we feel that the whole notion of it being a bazaar special is mocked by the events. He gets there, it's almost too late, a girl and two young men are chattering idly, oblivious of the boy's frantic desire to make something of his dream. One by one, the lights go out, and eventually the boy discovers, and we discover as we witness his reaction, that he has returned to the drab environment that he had hoped to be able to escape from. He's right back where he started from. In that final sentence, so beautifully cadenced. You listen to the, the actual rhythms of it when it comes up. In that final sentence, we get the summing up. Modern life is not kind to the questing night. Our romantic hopes are mocked, and we are left as in an empty television studio when the show is over, with the workmen clearing things away, covering the properties with cloths. At nine o'clock, I heard my uncle's latchkey in the hall door. I heard him talking to himself and heard the hall stand rocking where it had received the weight of his overcoat. I could interpret these signs. When he was midway through his dinner, I asked him to give me the money to go to the bazaar. He had forgotten. Ah, the people are in bed and after their first sleep now, he said. I did not smile. My aunt said to him energetically, Can't you give him the money and let him go? You've kept him late enough as it is. My uncle said he was sorry he had forgotten. He said he believed in the old saying, All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. He asked me where I was going. And when I had told him a second time, he asked me, did I know the Arab's farewell to his teeth? When I left the kitchen, he was about to recite the opening lines of the piece to my aunt. my beautiful, that standest meekly, meekly boy, but yes, such that standest meekly boy, with proudly arched glossy neck and dark and fiery eye, Fret not to roam the desert now with all thy winged speed. I may not mount on thee again. Thou art sold, me Arab steed. I held a florin tightly in my hand as I strode down Buckingham Street towards the station. The sight of the streets, filled with buyers and glaring with gas, recalled to me the purpose of my journey. I took my seat in a third-class carriage of a deserted train. After an intolerable delay, the train moved out of the station slowly. It crept onward among ruinous houses and over the twinkling river. At Westland Rose Station, a crowd of people pressed to the carriage doors, but the porters moved them back, saying that it was a special train for the bazaar. I remained alone in the bare carriage. In a few minutes, the train drew up beside an improvised wooden platform. I passed out onto the road and saw by the lighted dial of a clock that it was ten minutes to ten. In front of me was a large building which displayed the magical name. I could not find any sixpenny entrance, and fearing that the bazaar would be closed, I passed in quickly through a turnstile, handing a shilling to a weary-looking man. I found myself in a big hall, girded at half its height by a gallery. Nearly all the stalls were closed, and the greater part of the hall was in darkness. I recognized a silence like that which pervades a church after a service. I walked into the center of the bazaar timidly. A few people were gathered about the stalls which were still open. Before a curtain, over which the words Café Chantant were written in colored lamps, 
two men were counting money on a salver. I listened to the fall of the coin. Remembering with difficulty why I had come, I went over to one of the stalls and examined porcelain vases and flowered tea sets. At the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen. I remarked their English accents and listened vaguely to their conversation. Oh, I never said such a thing. Well, you did say it. Oh, but I didn't. Didn't she say that? Yes, I heard her. Oh, there's a fib. Observing me, the young lady came over and asked me, did I wish to buy anything? The tone of her voice was not encouraging. She seemed to have spoken to me out of a sense of duty. I looked humbly at the great jars that stood like eastern guards at either side of the dark entrance to the stall and murmured, No, thank you. The young lady changed the position of one of the vases and went back to the two young men. They began to talk of the same subject. Once or twice the young lady glanced at me over her shoulder. I lingered before her stall, though I knew my stay was useless, to make my interest in her wares seem the more real. Then I turned away slowly and walked down the middle of the bazaar. I allowed the two pennies to fall against the sixpence in my pocket. I heard a voice call from one end of the gallery that the light was out. The upper part of the hall was now completely dark. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. <laughs> Thank you.